Again, my name is Russ Miller with Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries, and tonight I want to do something a little different for us. We're going to actually talk about some history, and I want to reveal to you the relevance of biblical creation to both the gospel of Jesus Christ and also to the freedoms that Americans hold dear. I want you to realize as we go through this, if I use the term America or Americans, I'm referring to the United States of America and the citizens thereof. Most people don't seem to realize it, but you are all locked into the greatest war in the history of the world. And I'm not talking about a war on terrorism. I'm talking about a war that's already claimed billions of souls. This is not a war of bombs and bullets and airplanes. This is a war of thoughts, ideas, and philosophies. And at a foundational level, this is a secular worldview based on billions of years of death and suffering leading to Darwinian-style evolution versus the biblical worldview, which is based on the teachings found in Genesis leading to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There have already been billions of souls lost. This is a battle for the soul of all six billion people alive today. And it's a battle for the soul of every human that will live in the future. Karl Marx, who's known as the father of communism, stated that people without a heritage are easily persuaded, easily defeated. You see, if you don't have a heritage, you won't have anything to feel patriotic about. You won't have anything to stand up for or to defend. And Karl Marx said that the first battlefield is the rewriting of history. Historical revisionists have been teaching kids for the past 50 years that, number one, God had little or no role in the founding of this country and that he has had no success in America's success, or excuse me, no role in America's success over the past 200 years. Now, last March, my family and I were back in D.C. We were, I was doing some speaking in the uh, Maryland and Virginia area, and we visited our nation's capital. And I've got to tell you, we were blown away by the biblical verses and the references to our glorious creator that are etched in granite and marble and inscribed in brass on federal institutions all over our nation's capital. And if you have never been to Washington, D.C., I would urge you as a Christian to go there. You will be blown away by what you will find. You will find the heritage of America etched into stone on those federal institutions. The Bible says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You know, I started thinking after visiting D.C. that I should come up with a presentation that I would title, If the Foundations Be Destroyed, where I could show folks that America was indeed founded on Christian principles, that all men are created equal, and that creation is essential to America's freedoms. We are endowed with our freedoms, but with our rights from our biblical creator, and this way I could show people that to destroy America, one must simply destroy people's faith in the biblical accounts of creation. Because if we have no creator, we have no God-given rights. We have no creator-given rights if we stop believing in creation. In fact, founding father Jedediah Moore stated, whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present forms of re Republican forms of government must fall with them. This is one of our founding fathers. And to destroy the pillars of Christianity, one must simply destroy people's faith in the foundational accounts found in the book of Genesis. You see, the foundations for the gospel of Jesus are found in Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. This is where we're told that God created a perfect universe. There was no death, evil, or suffering in the original creation. It was perfect. And then it was man's original sin that separated us from our loving creator. This is the reason we needed to be reunited with our creator. This is the reason we needed to be redeemed. In fact, the first promise of the redeemer is found in Genesis chapter 3, where we're told that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. There's the foundation for the whole gospel of Jesus found in Genesis 1 and 3. 
a perfect creation corrupted by original sin that separated us from our creator. And that's the reason we need to be redeemed with our creator. Do you see how important Genesis is to the foundation of the gospel? The gospel of Jesus is that he is that redeeming savior. He came and lived a sinless life and died on a cross and was buried in a tomb and rose the third day. He took on our sin. The whole foundation for Jesus' gospel is in the first three chapters of Genesis. In fact, atheists understand this the best. This is from American Atheist Magazine. Destroy original sin. If Jesus was not the redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution and millions of years' beliefs mean, then Christianity is nothing. I agree with that statement 100%. We don't have to compromise God's word with secular atheist beliefs and philosophies. If the Bible's not true, we should just throw it out. But you see, our ministry is here to show you that the Bible is true, word for word and cover to cover, and it's our mistake when we compromise God's word. Because God's word is perfect, and it will stand the test of any scientific experiment. Jesus said you can tell good from bad by the fruit. Well, is creation relevant today? Let's just look at a couple of things here. Since 1963, when we kicked prayer and creation out of the schools and replaced it with the secular philosophy of Darwinian evolution, teenage suicide rates have tripled. Teenage birth rates are up 100%. Pregnancies are up over 500%. Most are killing their own children. And 71% of Christian-raised kids leave the faith the minute they leave the house. They don't return to the church because they're being taught the Bible's not true. And the church isn't standing up for this. And it's so easy to destroy evolution and millions of years' philosophies. But here's what I want to warn. If America's Christians continue down the road we've been on for the last 40 years, for another 5 to 10 years, Americans will lose their God-given freedoms. The United States of America itself will collapse. And the city is going to lose, it, the world is going to lose its city upon a hill. I received this email from a victim of our rewritten history, and this is what finally pushed me into putting this presentation together. This guy wrote to me, your attempt to convince others that Darwinism isn't true is unconstitutional. Well, so much for the First Amendment, right? He went on to state that you're a danger to society and should be in a mental institution before you take away the freedoms given to us by our forefathers. <laughs> wow. And of course, at first I thought, did my wife send this to me or what? But no. <laughs> She's not here, is she? Okay. Uh -oh. um, you know, this fella is a victim. He's a victim of our rewritten history because this is what is being taught in schools across our nation and has been for almost 50 years. People are being taught that Christians are trying to take away our freedoms. I want to show you tonight that our freedoms come because we are, were a Christian-based society at our beginning. So let's take a look at the fingerprint of God upon the history of America. The first great awakening was a great Christian spiritual revival which took place in the early to mid-1700s. At this point in time, the people of the land and the church had pretty much turned their back on the biblical God. Now, keep this in mind. This is very important to understand. The people at that time still held to the creation-based worldview. In other words, they understood the perfect creation corrupted by original sin and the need for redemption because we had been separated. They understood the need for the Redeemer. Well, when Paul preached to the Jews who understood the creation foundations of a perfect creation, original sin, and separation, he just began preaching that Christ is the redeeming Savior. He preached Christ died for your sins because they understood the foundations of why a Redeemer was needed. And he reaped a bountiful harvest of saved souls. Well, George Whitefield was a British evangelist. He came over and began preaching with a handful of God-honoring pastors. Now, most church doors were slammed in his face. He was preaching, Christ died for your sins. Well, soon he started preaching in open fields and town squares, and the crowds grew to the thousands. More pastors then began opening their doors, and pretty soon God poured forth his blessings, and we had a great awakening in this country. 
Soon all 13 colonies united as one nation under God. And the colonists soon demanded their freedoms back from the British and won their God-given rights back via the Revolutionary War. In fact, the uh, Liberty Bell is inscribed with Leviticus 25.10, which states, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Jesus said, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. The rock is the word of God, the uncompromised word of God. We're to build our faith. We're to build our families. We are to build our nations on the rock, not the shifting sands of man's philosophies. Founding father Benjamin Rush stated that the only foundation for a republic is to be laid in religion. And Christianity is the only true and perfect religion. Was our nation founded upon the rock? Well, 93% of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Christians. 95% of the authors and framers of the U.S. Constitution were Christians. This nation was founded by predominantly Christian men on predominantly Christian principles. We were founded upon the rock. In fact, John Hancock, the first signer of the Declaration, stated it becomes us as Christians to reflect that without his whole blessing, the best of human counsels are but foolishness. Uh, John Hancock, by the way, was the only signer of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. Nobody else signed it until August, a month later. That must have been a very tough month for John Hancock because he had signed his death warrant. <laughs> wonder if he felt the guys kind of left him hung out in the air there, right? John Hancock, what a guy. The Declaration refers to the biblical creator as our creator, as nature's lawmaker, as our supreme judge, and as our divine protector. Patrick Henry stated this nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that clear enough for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. In Genesis 1, we're told that God created man, male and female, in his own image. The Declaration states that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. You see, these rights come from our Creator. Nobody can take them from us. Our founding fathers understood that our rights come from the biblical Creator. Yet here's another email I received from yet another victim of our rewritten history. And he says, it's a shame you don't know our history and you won't get away with your Christian lies. He says the Constitution is a secular document. Well, now that is what's being taught in the schools. So let's see what the facts might have to say. Following the Revolutionary War, the states failed to remain united. So in 1787 a constitutional convention was convened in Philadelphia. The three main reference sources cited by the framers of the U.S. Constitution were, number one, the King James Bible, number two, the Spirit of the Laws, and the Commentaries on the Laws of England by Sir William Blackstone, who based his findings on the Ten Commandments of God. These three sources show that the rule of law is based on the never-changing natural law of God's Ten Commandments. That's the reason we're supposed to have equal justice in the United States is because the laws are supposed to be based on the never-changing Ten Commandments. Now that has changed and I'll, I'll explain why in just a few moments. But the fact of the matter is that the correct context in which we should interpret the Constitution is through the phrase that we are endowed by our Creator. In Exodus, we're told that God gave unto Moses two tables of stone upon Mount Sinai written with the finger of God. Well, Alexander Hamilton stated, I sincerely esteem the Constitution a system which without the finger of God, never could have been agreed upon by such a diversity of interests. The U.S. Constitution begins, We the people, 
Not I the king or I the tyrant or we the government because our founding fathers realized we were endowed with these freedoms from our creator. The power of the United States is in the people. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. At the Constitutional Convention in 1787, Ben Franklin proposed that each day should begin with prayer. Prayer to the biblical God. And since that time, every session of Congress has begun with a prayer to the biblical God. Well, until earlier this year when they opened up with a prayer to the false God of Islam. Hmm. George Washington is known as the father of our nation. He was the first U.S. president. At his inauguration, he ended his oath to office by, by saying, So help me God, I'm bending over to kiss the Bible. George Washington proclaimed the first national day of thanksgiving to the biblical creator. Our second president, John Adams, stated that our constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. It won't work if we don't have strong morals. Now, our rewritten history states that Thomas Jefferson, who was our third U.S. president and the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, our rewritten history says that he was a Christian skeptic. But that's not what the facts seem to back up. As president, Jefferson attended Christian church services that were held in the U.S. Capitol building. He wrote the educational plan for Washington, D.C. schools. He used the King James Bible as the primary reading book. He obviously wanted this country built upon Christian principles. In fact, to those who claimed he was against Christianity, he wrote that his, re his views were the result of a life of inquiry and reflection and much different from the anti-Christian system imputed to him by those who knew nothing about his opinions. Our uh, fourth U.S. president was James Madison, who is known as the author of the First Amendment's religion clause. So he should know if there was some separation of church and state, wouldn't you think? Well, he actually attended church services in the U.S. Capitol building as president, and he promoted the hiring of pastors for both the House and the Senate. Well, what about that constitutional separation of church and state? Well, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution is such a phrase mentioned. In fact, the uh, U.S. Constitution reads in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It's clear that the Constitution prohibits the establishment of an official government religion. But at the same time, it leaves religious activities to the discretion of the people of each individual state to decide upon for themselves. This was meant and written to protect religious activities, not to undermine our creation Christian-based freedoms. In fact, James Madison stated, we have staked the whole future of the American civilization not upon the power of the government, but upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. The Declaration, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, quotations and personal writings from our founding fathers all show that they formed us to be one nation under God. It's simply a fact that America's freedoms are based on Christian principles. Our founding fathers clearly intended to keep the federal government out of the church while keeping Christian principles inside of the government so the government would not become corrupted. Now, have Americans remained faithful to our biblical creator since the 1700s? Well, believe it or not, by the end of the 1700s, Europe's age of reason had invaded the United States. This was a group of man-made philosophies which tried to take God out of the picture and, and credit man with answering all of life's difficult questions. And sad to say, by that time, the American people and the church again had pretty much turned its back upon the biblical God. But keep this in mind, they still held to that creation-based worldview. They still understood a perfect creation corrupted by original sin that separated us from our loving creator. They still understood the need for a redeeming savior. 
Christian schools like Yale and Harvard had become worldly and secular. But in 1795, Yale appointed a new president by the name of Timothy Dwight. And President Dwight began urging seniors to return to serving God with their lives. Lyman Beecher was a senior at the time and he responded to President Dwight's call. In the 1820s, Pastor Beecher began preaching, Christ died for your sins. And soon his congregation began swelling. Other pastors opened their doors to this preaching and before long, God poured forth his spirit and we had another great awakening in the early 1800s. And we once again became one nation under God. In 1835, Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville wrote, Americans combine the notions of Christianity and liberty so intimately in their minds that it would be impossible to make them conceive one without the other. In 1835, you couldn't get Americans to even think of liberty without having Christian principles to back them up and to base them upon. In 1845, Andrew Jackson, our seventh president, stated that the Bible is the rock on which the republic rests. In 1848, the cornerstone of the Washington Monument was laid down. In it were placed copies of the Declaration, the Constitution, and the King James Bible. In fact, inscriptions and engravings on the monument glorify our biblical creator, stating such things as, in God we trust and search the scriptures. The U.S. Capitol building was completed in 1858. Our Christian heritage is seen throughout the building. Engravings in the walls include, In God we trust, in America God shed his grace on thee. Paintings in the rotunda include Pocahontas being baptized and the pilgrims praying for God's protection before setting sail for the new world. Above the house chamber's main door are 22 of history's greatest lawmakers. 11 on the left, 11 on the right, all facing one individual who's in the center facing forward. And that one individual facing forward is Moses. Our nation was founded upon Christian principles. In fact, stained glass in the Capitol Chapel building depicts George Washington kneeling to pray underneath the phrase, this nation, under God. The second great awakening also led the crusade to abolish slavery. In fact, the battle hymn of the Republic includes the words, as Christ died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. And 600,000 Americans died in the war to free the slaves. Abraham Lincoln stated that the Bible is the best gift God has given man. We could not know right from wrong without it. Ulysses S. Grant, our 18th president, warned us to hold fast to the Bible as the sheet anchor of your liberties. In other words, he warned us in the 1800s, if you lose the Bible, your freedoms are going to be in severe jeopardy. The Washington Monument took 36 plus years to complete. The delay was mainly because of the Civil War. An interesting side note of our history is when you visit D.C., when you look at the monument, you'll notice that about a third of the way up, the color of the rock changes. That's where the delay was. When they picked up construction after the Civil War, they used a different colored rock. Now, at the 1884 dedication ceremony, an aluminum cap was placed on top of the monument, 545 feet above the ground. On the east side of that aluminum cap are etched the Latin words above. The first thing lit by the rays of the sun every day in Washington, D.C. since 1884 are these words which translate, Praise be to God. The first thing lit in Washington, D.C. every morning since the 1800s. In 1900, Supreme Court Justice David Brewer said the American nation from its first settlement at Jamestown to this hour is based upon and permeated by the principles of the Bible. In 1922, the Lincoln Memorial was dedicated Engraved in the stone wall to Lincoln's left are the words from his second inaugural address. It's only 700 words long. 
Yet it contains two complete Bible verses and 14 references to the biblical God. In the mid-1900s, our 30th president, Calvin Coolidge, stated that the foundation of our society and government rest so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cease to be practically universal in this country. That was 80 years ago. In 1935, the National Archives were completed. A bronze depiction of the Ten Commandments is inscribed in brass in the entryway floor since it's the foundation of our Constitution and our legal system. For 200 years, the Supreme Court has begun each day with the proclamation, God save the United States and this honorable court. The building housing the Supreme Court was completed in 1935. Above the eastern portico are carvings of the history's greatest lawmakers. In the center is Moses holding a depiction of the Ten Commandments. To enter the Supreme Court, you must pass through two oak doors that have the depiction of the Ten Commandments engraved upon them. In fact, above the justices' benches are carvings including Moses holding the Ten Commandments. In a 1941 national public radio broadcast, FDR said that the Nazis are as ruthless as the communists in their denial of God. And he said that the coming war would be between human slavery and human freedom. And that America would side with human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. The Jefferson Memorial was completed and dedicated in 1943. This is my favorite memorial. If you go to Washington, make sure you go to the Jefferson Memorial. You'll find it very uplifting. This quote, etched in stone in letters 21 inches tall, adorn the inside of that dome. It rings the memorial and it states, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the minds of men which made me really wonder what he would think about our educational system and our biased media today. I don't actually wonder too much at all. <laughs> I think I know exactly what he would have said. Harry Truman, our 33rd president, stated in 1950 that the fundamental basis of this nation's law was given to Moses on the mount. If we don't have the proper moral background, we will finally end up with a totalitarian government. In 1952, Dwight Eisenhower stated the real fire within the builders of America was a faith in themselves as children of God. The Bible says you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. John F. Kennedy took his inauguration in 1961. At his inaugural address, he stated the rights of man came not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God, just 40 some odd years ago. It's just simply a fact the United States of America was founded by predominantly Christian men on predominantly Christian principles. And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And we were definitely a blessed nation for the first 200 years. We were not a perfect nation, but we were definitely a blessed nation. One of the greatest Americans of all time was Noah Webster. Noah Webster authored the first American Dictionary and the Blueback Speller, which, cha which taught and brought up American children for the first 150 years of our nation's history. He stated our continued success is dependent upon our educating the youth of America in the principles of the Christian religion. I think that bears repeating. Noah Webster said our continued success is dependent upon our educating the youth of America in the principles of the Christian religion. Yeah, I think that's worth, absolutely, God bless America. Unfortunately, I have to ask, is that what we've been doing for the past 50 years? So what in the world happened? Why did we stop Supporting our own freedoms and our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Well, it really began in 1859 when Darwin published his book, Origin of the Species. Now, what he did was he took an old idea, but more or less he popularized it. And it's, this was basically a philosophy that would get God out of the picture. 
Well, 10 years after his book came out, in 1869, Harvard appointed a new president, Charles Eliot. And a year later, Eliot appointed Christopher Langdale to be the new dean of the Harvard Law School. These two individuals had one thing in common. They both dedicated themselves to making Darwinism the new foundation for our laws and our educational system. In fact, it was Langdale who introduced what's known as case law study, which basically says our laws aren't based on the never-changing commandments of God, but that law evolves case by case over time. That's the reason we don't have equal justice anymore. You could have two guys do the same crime. One guy might get two years in prison and one guy might get 20 because the law now evolves case by case. In 1947, the U.S. Supreme Court discovered a separation of church and state in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Most folks don't realize it, but this was while ruling in favor of using federal funds to support religious school activities. But 15 years later, by 1962, the law had evolved. And now the Supreme Court used the same separation of church and state to remove prayer from school. A year later, in 1963, biblical creation was removed from the schools. Think about this. We remove the foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We remove the foundation for the very freedoms America was founded upon and replaced it with Darwinian evolution, the foundation for secular atheistic humanism. This is John Dewey. He was the first president of the American Humanist Association, the largest atheist group in America. He was a signer of the original Humanist Manifesto, which is based upon Darwinian-style evolution being true. His stated goal was to solve the Christian problem via the public school system. As hard as this is to believe, it was Dewey who introduced what's called progressive education into the school systems. This teaching system now dominates public school teaching. One of the most successful outspoken atheists in the history of the country introduced a teaching system that dominates public school teaching. Now, don't get me wrong, there are many good and godly teachers in our public school systems. And we need everyone in there that we can get. But keep this in mind also. For the past 45 years, America's school children, and this includes people who are teaching today, They've been taught our rewritten history and the pseudoscience of Darwinian evolution. As this textbook states, it's a fact that life on earth has evolved. I think we can take care of evolution, right? I mean, I can destroy Darwinian evolution in 7.2 seconds. Would you like to see me destroy evolution in 7.2 seconds? And that's if I take my time. <laughs> The DNA code barrier plus gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism scientifically impossible. Stop the clock. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. But we don't own the school systems, we don't own the textbooks, and we don't own the media. The only way to get this out is to reach Christians with it if we can get into churches and talk to them. So how did this religious fairy tale that has not a shred of evidence that it goes against multiple scientific laws and principles and all mathematical probability gets such a stranglehold on our educational and our scientific establishments. Well, this textbook says it all. It depended on an immense length of time. Millions of years is the magic ingredient for Darwinism. And I'll tell you right now, this is my own opinion, but I think Darwinism is just a diversion tactic by Satan. Millions of years' philosophies are the real attack on the Christian faith today. Most churches that won't let me talk won't let me talk because they believe in millions of years. And they know I don't stand up for millions of years. I can refute millions of years almost as fast as Darwinism. And I'm not here to attack anyone that believes in millions of years. Remember, I used to be a theistic evolutionist. I'm here to help you if you're seeking the truth of God's word. If you're not, you don't need to tell me about it. That's between you and Jesus. Yet I received this email from yet another victim of our rewritten history. He said, you make Americans stupid <laughs> by convincing weak-minded people that your invisible God created the world. He says Darwinism is a proven fact. Well, except for it goes against every fact there is. But... <laughs> I mean, this is what they're teaching in the schools. This, this individual is a victim. I realize that. But it's, it's not stupid 
And you're not taking away our freedoms by believing in the creator. Our freedoms come from the creator. When we have been taught, as we have been, that there's no creator, we're this close to losing our freedoms. We are this close because we're claiming there is no creator. And if we claim there's no creator, I'll tell you this, we don't deserve any freedoms from our creator. It's that simple. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I believe is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. It sounds like they're going to change biblical creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian style evolution, which puts death and suffering before man's sin. Yet here's another email I received from yet another one of the victims. He says, you're an anti-American communist using religion to take away our freedoms. You are despicable. And I thought, who wrote this, Daffy Duck? <laughs> you're despicable. <laughs> hey, you know, you have to have a good time when you get emails like this. You just have to, otherwise it'll drive you nuts. But you're not anti-American if you're a Christian. Our freedoms come from, from Christian principles. But see, our rewritten history has been teaching kids that Christians are trying to take away our freedoms and impose some theocracy on America. That is a total lie. Our freedoms come from our biblical creator. In fact, three of the four panels inside the Jefferson Memorial refer to God. Here is a Jefferson quote etched in stone in his memorial. He said, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Does it sound like if you stand up for God, you're trying to take away our liberties? Our liberties come from God. He asked rhetorically, can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? What's the answer to that? No. And this is etched in stone in the Jefferson Memorial. In fact, it was Darwinian evolution that provided the philosophical foundation for communism to thrive upon by getting God out of the picture. In fact, Mao Zedong, communist dictator of China 50 years ago, he killed 60 million people in China 50 years ago. He listed Charles Darwin as his favorite author. The Pledge of Allegiance was deliberately amended in 1954 with the words under God to make a clear distinction between America's God-given, creator-given rights and the atheistic tyranny of evolutionary promoting communist dictators. Roger Baldwin, founder of the ACLU, said that communism is the goal. Their lawsuits include banning the Bible, Christmas displays, the Ten Commandments, religious invocations, and moments of silence from public schools. They're trying to take God out of the picture. Are they trying to save our freedoms or take away our freedoms? Jesus said, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does them not will be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and it fell in great was the fall of that house. In 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was completed. There are no references to God. The FDR Memorial was completed in 1997. There are no references to God. His long-stemmed cigarette and wheelchair, Eleanor's Fox Soul, have all been removed, not fitting with our rewritten history. During World War II, the U.S. government issued more than 17 million Bibles to American military personnel. The memorial was completed in 2004. It contains no references to God. In June of 2002, the Ninth Circuit Court ruled it was against the U.S. Constitution to say that America is a nation under God. This has been temporarily repealed. Ronald Reagan said that Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Folks, you're in a war. You're in the greatest war of the history of the world. This is a war of worldviews. And the foundational level, this is the secular worldview based on millions of years leading to Darwinian evolution, Versus the biblical worldview, which is based on the teachings in the book of Genesis leading to the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
Yet millions of years in Darwinian evolution are taught as if there were science in our public schools and universities. It's not science, it's a religious belief with billions of taxpayer money backing it up. These teachings dominate public institutions. You can't go to a museum or a national park without being beaten over the head with millions of years fairy tales. They dominate the media from newspapers to televisions to children's cartoons. Barna Research did a study, a poll recently to see if the Christian church still holds to a biblical worldview. And they polled Protestant-oriented denominations, your more conservative denominations around the country. They asked a series of about six or seven questions. Now, if you answered no to any one question, you were deemed to not have a biblical worldview. Now, the questions I thought were pretty basic tenets to the faith, but the questions were, do you believe that Scripture is the inerrant Word of God, that God is omnipotent and omniscient? Do you believe that absolute moral truth exists that it's each person's duty to evangelize and that Jesus lived a sinless life. Well, the results were this. Of pastors preaching on Sunday mornings today, half did not agree with those statements. Two out of three seminary grads do not agree with those statements. And over 95% of Christians attending a church, over 95% did not agree with those statements. The simple fact of the matter is that secular beliefs are thriving in Christian schools, churches, and seminaries today. The American people have once again lost touch with the biblical God, and the church itself has turned its back on the biblical God. And you know, it, it pains me to even have to say this, but this is the fact, and, and this is what the studies show time after time again. Most church leaders tell me they won't let me speak to their people and show them the evolution, age of the earth issues because they say, oh, that's a non-essential. Well, wait a minute. Creation, original sin, and separation leading to the need for a redeemer is non-essential? And our kids are being taught that the Bible's not true, that we evolved over millions of years? That's a non-essential? No. They've compromised on the age of the earth, usually. And so they don't want me talking because I show there's no reason to believe. Now, I don't... I understand someone being fooled by those false teachings. I used to be a theistic evolutionist. I'm not attacking people that believe that. But there's something wrong when we close our minds to the fact the Bible's true. When I come in and say, I can show you the Bible's true, and they still don't want to see it, there's a problem, and it needs to be dealt with. Thomas Jefferson stated, and this is etched in stone in his memorial, Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Unless you think God has been sleeping through this, when you get home tonight, read Romans 1, verses 15 through 30. And you'll find out God hasn't been sleeping a bit, not one wink. The fact of the matter is that America needs another Christian revival. The simple fact of the matter is that the Christian church needs another great awakening. Now here's... The, the bad news is this. The people in the church, we've once again turned our back on the true biblical God. But the good news is we've done it twice before and God has poured forth his blessing and brought us back to him. And he can do it again. And he even tells us how to do this. But keep in mind there is a big difference today than the first two great awakenings. We no longer hold to a biblical foundation of creation, original sin, and separation. Today, we are an evolutionary-based society that thinks that millions of years of death and suffering brought us into the world. We have destroyed our own foundation. When Paul preached to people that did not hold that biblical foundation, he said, going and preaching Christ died for your sins to people that don't hold that creation-based foundation is foolishness. He tried preaching to the Greeks that didn't believe in creation and he, they thought, what's this babbler talking about? Redeemed with a creator? What's he talking about? And he said, and he showed us, he taught us in, in Acts that when you preach to people that don't believe in biblical creation, you first need to start out by building the foundations of creation. He told the Greeks of the God of creation. No doubt he built the foundations of the perfect creation, the original sin separating us from the creator, and the need to be redeemed. And then, then after preparing the soil, he planted the seed. He preached that Christ died for your sins and he reaped a bountiful harvest. 
Yet today we continue to preach Christ crucified to a society that's evolutionary based. It doesn't believe we were created. They don't believe, they believe in millions of years of death bringing us into the world. That eliminates original sin. And we're losing 71% of Christian kids when they leave the house. The Bible asks rhetorically in Psalms, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, the answer is found in 2 Chronicles. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And God can do it. We can't do it, but God can do it. Here are three things that all Christians need to be doing. And I'm talking about you and you and you, myself. Every true believer needs to be doing this immediately. We need to humble ourselves to God's word. We need to stop compromising God's word with secular atheist philosophies that undermine the reason for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We need to believe the word of God word for word and cover to cover. We need to pray and seek God's face. We need to ask God to forgive us for our individual sins and for the sins of our country and for the sins of the church. And thirdly, beloved, we need to earnestly contend for the faith. And we have not been doing that for the past 50 years. Here's some good news. Despite 45 years of secular propaganda, their pseudoscience, and their rewritten history, polls say, think about this, that 7 out of 10 U.S. adults want to believe that God created like he says he did. They don't believe it because they're being taught millions of years in evolution. But they want to believe it. If we could just get the information to them that we share in our presentations, you could see God pour forth his blessing on this country again because the evidence is all on our side. We need to contend for our faith because if America's Christians continue down the road we've been on, Americans are going to lose their God-given rights and the world is going to lose its city upon a hill. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I sincerely ask you to forgive me for my individual sins. I have gone against your word and I repent of those sins right at this moment. I ask you to please forgive the sins of the church for turning its back on you and taking in secular atheist philosophies over your word. And I ask you to please forgive and heal this land, this country, and bless us again as you did for the first 190 years of our existence. Please bring us back to you. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.